Hello friends, in this video I'm going to be answering your questions that you guys posted on my Instagram. I obviously don't know the answers to some of the questions, but the reason I'm answering these is to make sure that you guys uh, don't feel ignored and don't feel like I uh, missed your questions or didn't care that you asked them. I certainly do care. For the questions that I don't know the answer to, some of them I'll add them to my video research list and I'll make separate videos uh, eventually to address them in detail. Let's get started. So the first question is by El Eliud Onofre. He says, what PCT would be recommended for someone who quit cold turkey? For example, Tren. I asked because I did during the pandemic. So the basic principle of PCT is to control estrogen. That's really, all, that's the whole reason you have Clomid there or an EI or anything else. Estrogen is a negative feedback indicator to the hypothalamus in the synthesis of what's called gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is the beginning of the steroidogenesis cascade. As long as you keep estradiol between 15 to 25, and ideally lower, if it's 15 is maybe ideal, you just don't want to have sexual dysfunction while you do so, the lower you keep it, the more likely you ha likelihood you have of the brain restarting the steroidogenesis cascade. Uh, you can also block, for example, opioid receptors with 50 milligrams of naloxone every other day. This is something I've suggested. Um, I don't think anyone uh, really did it before, um, but it seems to be useful as well. The other approach to this whole thing is to use HCG. If you use HCG, you're, now, you're actually going to provide more negative feedback indicators to the hypothalamus because you have higher androgen levels and all that. But some people start by using HCG to wake up the gonads, the testicles, and then they, or, and the whole time obviously they block estradiol, and then they remove the HCG and continue blocking estradiol so the brain can restart. This should never happen because on cycle you should already be using HCG and your ball should never have stopped working completely. So it's basically controlling estradiol, and if you want to do a little bit extra, controlling the mu opioid receptor by blocking it with like 50 milligrams of naloxone every other day. All you have to do is do that for a few weeks and then you can retest your levels and once your testosterone climbs back up, you can decide to take the AI out. This is not medical advice, but just my experience. Next, Natalie, oh, it's a lady. Natalie JKAFBB says, T3 and burn muscle. Is it true that high dose T3 can be uh, catabol can catabolize muscle? How it works? Uh, of course, yeah. T3 does catabolize muscle, muscle if it's very high. Um, because when you increase your metabolism in your body, your body, your body needs nutrients and energy from somewhere. And if it can't get that energy efficiently from fat, it'll get it from other places. And then she says, tell more about DNP. Is it burn muscle? More about side effects and positive effects. DNP is a mitochondrial uncoupler. It basically makes your mitochondria inefficient. You know, uh, metformin does something similar. Metformin is a mitochondrial toxin, but not an uncoupler. The uncouplers basically make your mitochondria expend energy that it doesn't need to. I'm not sure if it burns muscle. We don't have really studies on that. I've used DNP myself, unfortunately, for a period of time. Uh, when you're on it, you feel like you're losing muscle. Your, your muscles will uh, lose their full look. And in fact, you start to retain also water, uh, subcutaneous water. So it's a, it's a weird look, but I don't know if it burns muscle. This is really a question you should ask to Boston. Boston has a lot of experience with this. Next, Jamie Collier123 says, could a GLP-1 agonist be used as an appetite suppressant while running DNP? This is a, obviously, just for you guys to know, if you run too much DNP, you will die. Just, then there's no way that they can, uh, you know, help you with that. You'll, you'll die even if you go into a hospital. So I just want to make that clear. This is a very, 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 very dangerous drug. With that said, uh, I don't see any reason why it, you couldn't combine it with a GLP-1 agonist. You'll have slightly higher insulin levels, but it, it should, if you're running a very low dose of DMP, which is like 100 milligrams or 200, um, it might be safe. Um, however, as I said, it could kill you, so be very careful. There's no, there's no reason to die to be uh, less fat. That, that's not worth it. Really, it's not worth it. Be very careful. And by the way, DMP is no miracle. Everybody can lose fat if they're just patient enough. You know, all you really need is an appetite suppressant, which the GLP-1 agonist is a safe one. If you have an ap appetite suppressant and you uh, do cardio, you don't need to use these crazy, d dangerous, potentially dangerous drugs. You can use DMP for other reasons other than use losing weight. But if you're using it just to lose weight, I think it may not be an efficient thing and it may be too dangerous to be worth it. Next, um, Lord of Phantasm says, specific training for specific compounds and stacks. More volume when a higher amount of anabolic is present versus higher intensity and higher relative intensity. 
low rep ranges when using more androgenic compounds. So first of all, you know, this anabolic androgenic thing is really, people use this, bodybuilders use this very incorrectly. They use these terms sort of the way they use the term symmetry, when they actually mean proportion. They don't mean symmetry. Symmetry, you know, anyway, they do the same thing here. All derivatives of testosterone are androgens. That's what they are. They are androgens. And those, those androgens happen to be anabolic. Anabolic means they're trophic to muscle. Trophic means they, they grow muscle. So that's not a, I, I don't, you know, it's not a good uh, dichotomy saying that there's some are androgens and some are anabolics. Also, which do you think is more appropriate for specific phases, off season? Yeah, so the question is again about androgens versus anabolics. I don't even know what you mean by that, honestly. Some bodybuilders will say that Primo is an androgen and Mastron is an androgen. Well, Primo will cause you to gain muscle, Mastron won't. So they're both androgens that are a little bit anabolic. One is more anabolic than the other one. So I think this question is like, I don't really understand how you'll separate the androgens as being anabolic or not anabolic. And again, I don't know anything about hypertrophy. I've never trained for it. So I would not be the right person to ask, to be honest. Next, Ben, but thank you for your question though. I don't mean to be disrespectful. I just mean, I don't really know. I'm not a hypertrophy guy. I've never even studied it, never even read about it, and never tried it myself very much, except for very short time periods in my life. When I was young, I hated the idea of looking stronger than you are. I always wanted to be stronger than I looked. So I had a completely different approach. And second, the, I don't even know really which compounds. So then would you say Tranbolone is an andro androgenic, not anabolic? Because it's both, right? Uh, so you know, you know what I mean? Anyway, next. Ben Taggart says, hey Leo, Ben Zotag from YouTube here. Hello. What are your favorite and least favorite injection spots? I've heard horror stories about pinning the quads, but I know a lot of doctors recommend that spot. Any thoughts? That's funny, actually, you asked that. When I first used steroids when I was 22 or so, I used them for about a year on and off. It was a short time period, maybe total like four months, but over a year. Almost did all my injections in my quads. I have never had any problem with injecting the quads uh, at all. Uh, but there are other people who say that there, there's so many nerves and you're going to hurt yourself. I had no problem with it. With that said, when I became more uh, educated about the subject, I stopped doing that stuff. I don't like to inject with a big needle. To be able to inject into the quads, I mean, you could inject with a small needle, but there, there's a muscle fascia and the quads is a bit thicker. I think it's a little harder to do it with an insulin syringe. I like to inject mostly in the chest. This is the easy, if it's gonna be intramuscular. It's very easy for me. I can't really reach the shoulders very easily because usually when I'm using steroids, my shoulders are a bit wide, so it's very hard to reach. But the, the top of the chest here has very little body fat for me. I backload an insulin syringe and inject there. That's the easiest way for me. I can inject the CC here, another here, another here, another here. If I wanted to inject five, I could keep going around the, around the pec. And with insulin syringes, you don't develop scar tissue. When you use big syringes, you're gonna develop scar tissue. You're gonna slowly ruin your muscle over time. You're gonna get less um, uh, blood flow there, the shape will change and so on. So I don't like to do those big needle injections. And I highly recommend for those of you that haven't used backloaded an insulin syringe, go on YouTube. I think Tony Huge has videos on it maybe. Uh, other people used to before. Learn how to backload an insulin syringe and then you can inject anywhere without hurting yourself, you know? Uh, next, Miltos Vut says, is HCG a viable option for long-term hormone optimization? Yes, it is. Uh, if you have, basically, if your balls work, you can um, override your brain signal with HCG. Uh, also, with that, ha but, but, but with that said, I wouldn't use extremely high doses of HCG because if you do, you're gonna make your balls work harder than they would naturally. And if you, you could do that for a short time period, but if you do that long-term, I would think that you would have increased risk of uh, testicular cancer. So you don't want to be like using 5,000 units every other day for a long time. Although there are fertility studies doing that and none of those people ever develop testicular cancer. But still, personally, I would be afraid of it. He said also, would that have any effect on babies that would be conceived while on HCG? Um, potentially, although the evidence is mostly for women that are using Clomid or luteinizing hormone, stuff like that. I, I made a video on this called um, um, Will... Uh, Will HCG make your child short or something like that? It'll be out soon and you can learn more about that there. Ernesto Bullboy says, astragalus root or extract for kidney health. You know, it's, there's so many anecdotal reports, including from Boston, of having much better kidney markers when they use large doses of astragalus. But I haven't researched it academically. 
too much because a lot of the research I believe is from um, Eastern sources, but I need to look into it. I haven't researched it that much to be honest. J.A. Tucker says how to boost low testosterone in females. Well, one way is by supplementing with DHEA. DHEA raises testosterone in females, but not in men. Next, side AC side AC zero says, can you please do an update on post finasteride syndrome and how to treat it? It's killing me, man. Also, can you please tell the audience that it's real? There are lots of people that are calling us psychosomatic and mentally sick. No, it's, it's certainly real. There's no question about that. There's a lot of evidence of that in the literature. Post finasteride syndrome has so many different um, impacts. So for example, um, the, main, the main issue is this. When you introduce a drug into your body, you can change the way your body decides to express its genes. So you can have a long-term effect where the body sort of gets stuck expressing genes in a certain way. This is a change in epigenetics. This is what I believe happens in post finasteride syndrome usually. Although there are permanent effects. So for example, you can see that when rat rodents take finasteride, the cells in their penis die because the penis uh, requires, uh, probably in all animals, requires DHT signaling to keep it alive. Specifically, the androgen receptor in the corpus cavernosum of the penis, when you signal the androgen receptor, it increases endothelial nitric oxide synthase, ENOS, which dilates the blood vessels. I believe that having lower androgenic signaling locally at the penis causes a loss of blood flow in the penis, which then causes cell death. You see the cell death in the rodent studies, but they don't know the exact mechanism of how it happens. That's why some people who are taking finasteride will notice a numbness in their penis or will notice they'll get erections, but the erections are a little bit narrower. They lose some girth. This is why that happens. On the other hand, in the brain, a couple of things happen. So a lot of you guys know about allopregnanolone. Allopregnanolone is synthesized via 5-alpha reductase, which is inhibited by finasteride. Allopregnanolone acts exactly like a benzodiazepine in your brain. It holds open the GABA-A receptors, like a benzo, like Xanax, like Valium. So when you take finasteride and you don't take Valium or Xanax, you've just unzanaxed yourself. Like you've, you're now minus a benzo from, from, from your natural state. So what will happen when you have less GABA signaling, those GABA-A receptors are less active, you'll have a bit of a, too much excitatory activity in the brain. So you'll get oxidative stress because it's not being inhibited. This could cause brain fog. It could also cause like uh, sensitivity to noise, to light because of too much excitatory activity. This will cause neuroinflammation in the long term. You could test this by testing your interleukin-8. That's one cytokine from the immune system that is often specific to the nervous system and elevated when you have neuroinflammation. Um, but the other side of it is that you have less androgens in your brain and that causes usually less dopamine and noradrenaline signaling. So you might have excess glutamate activity, too little inhibitory activity, you can end up with anxiety and with a lot of other things. I've, I've seen a lot of people have luck with using Wellbutrin uh, concurrently with the finasteride. I'm not talking about recovery. Recovery may require, I mean, it's hard to recover, you know, you have to change your epigenetics. So maybe increasing neuroplasticity, um, using HDAC inhibitors, things like that may help you recover in the long term. But while on finasteride, if you want to inhibit the side effects, one of the ways to do it is by using Wellbutrin. A lot of people had great success with that, using it like six days a week, five days a week in the mornings, maybe dosing it twice, once in the morning, once and around noontime. And the second thing people have had great luck with is sodium valproate, but titrating very slowly. 250 milligrams extended release Depakote, which you can find, find at like clearskypharmacy.biz. 250 milligrams twice a day, 12 hours apart and only raising the dose when you have absolutely no GI effects or stomach discomfort or anything like that. A lot of people have had success with these two inhibiting a lot of the symptoms other than the sexual symptoms. The sexual symptoms are a little bit dif more difficult to get around while you're on it, but sometimes HCG can do that quite well. But there are other options also. But yes, it's certainly a real syndrome and it's interesting how similar it is to post-Accutane syndrome. Next, James U8 says hair loss prevention. What compounds to avoid? This is something you should check out with Derek. I'm not, although I obviously have lost some hair over the years, I'm not really that prone to hair loss, so I can't really tell. There are people like Victor Black who lie about compounds, who also are not very prone to hair loss and just don't know what they're talking about. They say things like Mastron is hair safe. It's not. If you know anybody that is very prone to hair loss, they'll tell you it's not, like Derek will. So I would go to Derek's channel to learn about this. What helps to grow back hair 
inhibiting androgen uh, signaling at the scalp. You can use something like RU or, uh, or uh, finasteride or dutasteride. If you've lost the hair very recently, it can regrow from that. And otherwise, minoxidil can increase the density of hair as well. So those are a couple of things to think about. Renato Molinat says, thanks uh, for your work, Leo. I'm a big fan of the channel. Well, thank you so much, Renato. He says, any thoughts on how to reverse or slow down polycystic kidney disease? This genetic disease was found to be found uh, to respond positively to ketogenic diets and fasting, sh showing to be so effective that some individuals have shown to reverse the condition and improve in some markers of the disease, like improvements on GFR and total kidney volume. I wonder if you have any idea why the diet and fasting works, and if you know any supplements to accelerate kidneys recovery from PKD. I don't know anything about polycystic kidney disease, but with that said, the, I would think that there is some obvious um, uh, assumptions we can make. So when you're eating more carbohydrates, you store more glycogen in the body. There's more fluid that the kidney has to work around. We know that, for example, empagliflozin that causes you to excrete some uh, water uh, slows down the progression of chronic kidney disease. So I think holding a lot of uh, glycogen in the body may put stress on the kidneys. In addition, sugar causes oxidative stress in the body and sometimes can be cytotoxic. Um, so maybe that's the reason. But I don't know much about this, brother. Really, you would, I would suggest you go to the my how-to research video and then look into it yourself on scholar.google.com. You can sometimes learn a lot of things that your doctors don't know about. Uh, next, Steffi says, hey, Leo. If I wanted to supplement T4 because of prolonged HCG uses, how much should I take per day and when? Thanks. So you should take it in the, uh, this is not doctor, uh, this is not uh, medical advice, but you could you should take it in the morning so that you have more in your system in the morning than at nighttime. And all you really need to do, if you really wanna be careful about this, is get your TSH to somewhere around 1.0 or 0.5 in the American scale. To do that, you can just start with a dose of like 50 micrograms of T4, levothyroxine in the morning, and then test your uh, blood work, and you'll see what your TSH is, is at. Then you may have to increase it, you probably will, to 100 micrograms, maybe 150, maybe 200, until you get it low. When you get it low, you know that the, that the that you're, you have less of a signal to grow the thyroid, to get thyroid cancer, and HCG is doing some stuff that you can't account for. So something between 0.5 to 1 may be safe, I think. Uh, next, Yelengli says, I know you believe artificial sweeteners are harmful, are awful. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. Stevia is an antioxidant, and I don't think so. Uh, I am not a pre-workout guy anymore, but I would always buy my ingredients in bulk and make my own when I was one. Any pre-workout that was worth taking back then had a ton of sucralose. Sucralose is still the main sweetener even today. Would you recommend a great pre-workout like Derek's Gorilla Mode line or tell people to stay away because of sucralose? Man, l let me be clear. Uh, artificial sweeteners are not nearly as damaging as sugar is. Uh, so if you're eating like a high carbohydrate diet with uh, uh, simple carbohydrates and stuff like that, white rice, you're damaging your body more than you will with, from the artificial sweeteners. And in particular, if you're eating something like with fructose, um, you're gonna you damage your body more. I, I don't demonize artificial sweeteners. I think you're getting the wrong impression. They're certainly un unhealthy compared to not taking them, except for stevia, maybe, but they're far more healthy than sugar. So, you know, it's not, I, I'm not like, uh, the people who get obsessed with artificial sweeteners don't really understand how damaging sugar is to the brain and to the body. Next, Dan Thompson Canada says, Leo, what are your thoughts on R modafinil slash Novigil or modafinil slash Provigil? Modafinil is a, Basically, modafinil is a less dopaminergic drug than Ritalin, which is a less dopaminergic drug than amphetamine. Modafinil is barely dopaminergic. It, has, it causes increases in noradrenaline signaling, which seem to be responsible for the increased wakefulness. Those drugs, I think, are only useful for people that are narcoleptics or, or lazy. One of those two things. Either people that have issues staying awake or they're just lazy. If you have a concentration issue, you really want to work around dopamine, unless you're a person that gets easily addicted to drugs. One of the worst things about modafinil, I'm not sure if this is the case for our modafinil, is its, ex it's, its long half-life. Modafinil will harm your sleep no matter what you do. So I, I find it to be like a, like a poor man's version of Ritalin. It's, re it's, re it's really crap. And I think of Ritalin as a poor man's version of amphetamine. It's, it's not a great drug at all. Most people are into it just because they've never really experienced better drugs. 
but I'm not sure. Maybe our modafinil has a shorter half-life, and you need to be awake. That's the reason someone would take it. Sort of like caffeine, you know. Uh, next, Graciano Gabriel says, "Amazing, Leo. I read that, for example, Winstrol produces more college, but on a different way than that is more stiff. What can cause? Well, bro, you gotta, you gotta do. Is maybe you're doing Google Translate, but this is hard to understand." They compare to big tree that is easier to break than a thinner bamboo would you, Okay, I can't read all this thing, but I see this guy is saying that one of the androgenic steroids increases collagen synthesis in a particular way I would ignore those studies First of all when you think about collagen synthesis, it doesn't mean the collagen is being put in your joints in adulthood Most of the collagen that you're using I mean not most of it But a lot of the you're using more collagen to develop scar tissue than you are to uh, rejuvenate your joints or something like that so if you increase collagen synthesis with a drug, you're probably increasing scar tissue deposition in your heart, in your liver, wherever, you know? So that's one thing. And second of all, those studies on collagen th synthesis were really old and they're not well-performed studies, like the ones on Anavar in particular. On the other hand, Winstrol, I know you're not talking about this, but the worst thing about Winstrol re really is um, its effect on acutely on joints. It seems to weaken them somehow drying the body out, making people much more susceptible to uh, to uh, injury. I only used Winstraw once myself. Within a week and a half or so, I realized that I was going to injure myself with my lift, so I stopped. Next, he says, Nebivolol versus Ezetimibe. Oh, the, uh, the, bro, the, to tell Mesartan to reduce resting heartbeat. Bro, you, you're very off. Ezetimibe is not a has nothing to do with heart rate. Ezetimibe is a, it inhibits your ability to digest um, cholesterol and to pull cholesterol from bile fluid. It's a completely different medication. You need to study these things better, brother. You're very off. You should not use drugs if you have this flimsy of, of an understanding of them, really. You should not use them. You should not. You should study more, really. Next, Gaines82 says, Hi, Leo. You seem to suggest SSRIs for overall brain health, but it seems that they are anticholinergic. No, I don't suggest SSRIs for everybody. I suggest SSRIs for people that want to limit the incidence of dementia and maybe retain more of their brain as they age but i don't think everybody should be on them not at all M many people have issues with it and also i only and also i also maybe suggested for people that have anxiety or depression um i don't know where you get this idea that they are anticholinergic um i'm not quite sure he says whereas nootropics like alpha gpc seem to work by boosting acetylcholine no, alpha GPC causes you to release reserve choline in your body that then passes the blood brain barrier and goes into your brain. He said, so would taking an SSRI cancel the effects of nootropic supplements? No. The main thing that SSRIs do is not anticholinergic, but anti-dopaminergic. The more serotonin you have, the more you're inhibited from dopaminergic activity, but also the more neurogenesis you have, the less you can feel dopaminergic activity. So for example, if you were taking five milligrams of Adderall, um, and it was working for you, if you got on an SSRI and went to a high dose in six months, that five milligrams of Adderall would start to feel like one milligram or two milligrams. So that's one of the major problems. About the cholinergic system, you should look into Donapezil, D-O-N-E-P-E-Z-I-L. That's an interesting drug. Next, Jared Vosen says, what are the top three neurology, neuroscience books you would suggest for novices on the topic? As I said in the how to research video, people in this field do not com communicate through books, they communicate through papers. What I would do if I were you is read review papers on the subject, not look at books. If you look at books, you'll be outdated and you'll be discussing things in really colloquial terms. And to be honest, I have never read a book on neuroscience myself, ever. Uh, I've only used textbooks in college, maybe a little bit cognitive science and maybe a little bit in neuroscience, but I haven't used them myself and I wouldn't recommend them. There are a lot of fun neuroscience books on a lot of interesting topics, um, like on music or on uh, the, uh, the, the spirit and things like that, but they're not a good place to learn. You should learn from research papers, from specifically review papers. Uh, next, Chris Green says, do you think cerebrolysin slash increasing neural growth factors can be a good ancillary for trenbolone? used to help mitigate some of its neurological effects or would there be other compounds you would recommend? The best compound would be an SSRI, not cerebrolysin. Um, although cerebrolysin would protect the brain from damage, it's been shown, because if you look at the studies on testosterone in the brain, when you inhibit aromatization of testosterone, there's neurotoxicity in the brain. Well, how does that happen? Estrogen modulates serotonin. 
So the best approach I would use is to increase serotonergic signaling, thereby increasing neurogenesis and thereby protecting the brain. SSRIs would be the best course of action, but the problem is it takes six months or so to use an SSRI properly. You have to start at a very low dose and very slowly raise the dose. Otherwise, you'll end up with side effects and other problems. I would look at something like fluvoxamine or amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is maybe the most power powerful one because it binds directly to the receptors for, ner for nerve growth factor and brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So it works even at a micro dose, whereas other SSRIs, they have to get to a minimal dose to inhibit the activity of CERT to cause neurogenesis. Next, Alain Van R R Rijn says, loving the channel and finally sliding into your IG comments. I wonder why people slide on Instagram. They slide into DMs, they slide into comments. They don't walk, they slide. He says, what are your thoughts on har harm, uh, harm potential and reduction when inhaling nitrates, also known as poppers? Oh, are poppers nitrates? I had no idea what they were. I've, I've seen a video about them on a channel called Vice. Very interesting. Um, he says, PS, so excited about the Cerebrolysin I ordered from Cosmic Eutropics using code Leo, of course. Oh, well, that's great. I hope you have fun with Cerebrolysin. There are compounds, phytochemicals and so on, that neutralize reactive nitrogen species. The problem with nitrates is that when nitrates are co-located with proteins, for example, in processed meats, they can produce a reactive compound called nitrosamines. They can also, also nitrates in general, when they're uh, consumed by us, about 5 to 10% of them gets converted into nitrites. These are damaging molecules that produce reactive nitrogen species as opposed to reactive oxygen species. There are many ph phytochemicals that can neutralize reactive nitrogen species. You can read about them on scholar.google.com, but that's what you want to look for on that subject. And by the way, this is the nitrates are the main reason, or nitrosamines in particular, are the main reason that processed meats are associated with cancer. And that's the one of the main reasons that people say that meats are associated with cancer. The other reason is, of course, the activation of mTOR, the major growth pathway, as well as TMEO, and there's a couple other issues. But nitrates are, are a serious concern, and you should look for uh, uh, phytochemicals or yeah, I mean, phytochemicals that neutralize reactive nitrogen species. Next, TubeCast says, Leo, on a future episode, could you give your opinion on people going to Istanbul for hair transplants and gyno surgery? Um, is Turkey a safe location to have these procedures done for a low price? What recommendations do you have for these procedures and what are the, what are the prices to expect? These are popular topics. Yeah, I would never do this myself. I have a friend actually who recently went to Iran, did even a hair transplant even cheaper than in Turkey. The problem is this. The hair transplant depends a tremendous amount on the skill, the artistic skill of the doctor. So I believe that what you'll find is that the, 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 the patterns of the hair transplants will be inferior in Turkey and that more of the hairs transplanted will fail. So personally, I would never do this. And also I would never do gyno surgery outside the United States. And in fact, in the United States, I would only do it with maybe two or three doctors. So I, I would never do this personally, never, uh, absolutely not. Uh, I've been to Turkey before as well, and I know a little bit about it, but their medical, uh, they have a lot of like uh, medical tourism, but their, their medical establishment is inferior by far to Western medicine. I mean, really inferior. So next, uh, Cam Confirm says, have you ever come across a book called Waking the Tiger? No, I have not. So it talks about the effects on one's sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system caused by physically slash emotionally traumatic experiences. And I'd be really in interested in hearing you talk about the hormonal chemical component of those processes. Well, what happens is it's shown that in people that uh, this is the development of PTSD. So when you have heightened uh, adrenaline signaling, which is what happens from uh, having a traumatic experience, especially in childhood or in, in youth, you have heightened adrenaline signaling. Over time, this part of the brain called the amygdala, which, which mod, mo modulates your fight or flight response, it's, the amygdala is mainly activated by adrenaline and inhibited by GABA. It becomes disconnected from the rest of the brain, less responsive to inhibitory signaling from the rest of the brain. And over time, this adrenaline system becomes overactive. So what you see in these people is GABAergic deficits and increased adrenaline signaling. And this over time produces PTSD. 
So that's that's what happens basically. There's a lot of research on the subject. I would recommend you don't read books on this. They're inferior. Go and read the papers because all the all the guy ri re writing the book is doing is he's reading the paper and trying to make it simpler for you and adding a bunch of probably I don't know this book, but adding a bunch of useless text in between. You can just read the papers directly to get a better understanding. Don't let papers intimidate you, you know? Um, it, even if you find like the vocabulary a little bit weird in, initially, if you keep trying, you'll understand the papers. You don't need to have these people, um, like these me middlemen giving you information. Like I'm sort of a middleman, but this is a little bit different because my channel has a lot of random topics and stuff like that. But you don't need a middleman, really. You can do it yourself. Next, serious muscle with a C, which is a cool name. He says, I just watched your video. What's the dosage for acute use of memantine? Usually it's around 10 milligrams. He said, I have used it before, but it's always after slowly building up to a higher dose. I love the channel. I ordered cerebrolysin. Uh, yeah, you don't really have to start at much of a lower dose with memantine. It doesn't have many side effects. Donapazil, for example, you do, but not so much with memantine. He said, I ordered cerebrolysin based on your video. I will comment on my results at 10 milliliter per, per week. I'm excited to hear your comment. And, and note that you'll have different results over time. So you should update your comment as well. Uh, gods with a Z. Oh, another question from him. He said, how often should adults and teens fast? So the, the current thinking, according to at least Walter Longo, who is the world's best resource on this subject, he says that adults should fast according to how much damage they do to their bodies. He says some people maybe fast every month for five days, others every quarter for five days, others every uh, six months for five days, and others maybe once a year for five days. I was, as you guys know, fasting for five days every month. I haven't done that for a few months. And I probably won't do it quite yet because I gained a little bit of muscle now and I want that muscle to uh, solidify before I do my fast. But I'm going to continue doing it once a month also myself. But as for teens, the leading scholars on the subject believe that even uh, high, high protein consumption in childhood and in uh, adolescence can cause people to age faster. But at the same time, if you don't have that high pro protein consumption and high IGF-1 levels, which fasting will inhibit, uh, the child won't grow to their full potential in height. It's been shown that the increased height in Europeans over the last century is mainly due to increased protein consumption. So personally, I wouldn't have my children eat low protein or fast until they reach their maximal height because height does matter in life. It affects especially males a lot. It affects their ability to defend themselves. It affects how they're treated by women and so on. So personally, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I wouldn't have them fast in, in teenage years. He says, do you know if there, if there is a point where it is harmful for these groups? No. I, 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 other than the height thing for teenagers, I don't think that fast, because you can look at people that do caloric restriction in adults. Although there is some evidence, there's one person who was doing caloric restriction, I forgot his name, a guy from, um, from UCLA, who ended up with an interesting disease, probably from the stress of having too little nutrients for too long. But it's rare to find people like that. I think that normally people can get away with fasting five days a month quite easily. Next, Martin Stratzma, Stratzma says, what's up? What is your opinion on e-readers? I think he's talking about like, um, like uh, I, the iPad and things like that, the Amazon one. I don't like those things. The more you physically can engage with what you're reading, the more you remember the more levels of engagement you have. So if you can underline, if you can annotate, if you can comment, if you can feel the paper on your in your hand, I think you can do this all slightly to a less degree with e-readers. Although now they're very advanced, you can, you can add annotations and stuff like that. If you can add a lot of annotations and underline and highlight and do all that kind of stuff, it may be quite valuable, but I still think the lack of holding the paper in your hand may limit it a little bit. But that's just my uh, hypothesis. Plus, to be honest, I, I bought so many books now that I can't, can't give up on them. I have, yeah, I, have a, I have a very large library, not just here, but in Dubai as well. So I like to keep my books, uh, enjoy them. And the nice thing is I can always go to those books and I can see all my notes in it and see what I thought years ago and so on. I, I, can't, I don't trust the e-readers. They, they change their the product model. You might switch the companies eventually, you know what I mean? Anyway, next, uh, Wolf Mike says, opinions on fasting for fat loss and its effect on muscle loss and metabolism. I've talked about this so many times and Wolf, you've been following the channel for a long time. You know that short fasts don't cause muscle loss. They just don't. Um, they really don't. What the problem may be though is if you fast for five days, uh, say every month, then you have about two weeks or a week and a half of low IGF signaling. That can limit your ability to grow muscle in the long term. But losing muscle during the fast, it doesn't really happen that much. You lose less muscle during a fast, I believe, 
irrespective of what the studies show, than having a caloric restriction over time. Okay, we have five questions left. Almost finished. This is not question 61. Shrewers guy says, hey Leo, I was wondering if you could help me. I have, or it says hi Leo. I have been training and bodybuilding for over 10 years, developed a nice physique. Now since a year I'm doing endurance sports as well. Tennis and racquetball for instance. I was wondering if you could suggest PEDs, supplements, research chemicals, drugs, or any other to improve cardio, respirator, respirator and vascular function on the field. Currently I'm experiencing with hypoxin, meldonian, meldonium, car cardarine, and stenbolic, but my information is limited. Any help would be welcome. Kind regards, guy. Well, I don't know too much about that, to be honest with you. Other than cardarine and increased uh, erythropoiesis, I don't really know what helps with endurance stuff, to be honest with you. I haven't really studied this too much. Um, I am still more focused on health than I am in performance, to be honest with you. So most of what I read about is about health or cognitive performance. I'm much less interested in athletic performance, you know? And, and Lezzy says, total test, what the hell? He, so he's asking if he needs an AI. S he said, second he adds an AI, everything goes downhill. His estradiol is 100 PG per ml. And he feels amazing. No, I, you, we have videos on this, man. You check out my videos. Search estradiol or aromatase inhibitor or serum on my channel and find out. You know, I wish you guys, I wish sometimes these people ask questions. I'm like, I have two videos on the subject. Just check it out, man. Next, Svartsan says, hey, hey Leo, great channel. I am asking for a female friend thinking of testing Anavar, five milligrams every day to recover strength and fitness from an injury that kept her from training for a few months. I can barely find any info about female use of PEDs and I'm having a hard time giving her any guidance. Well, you should check out the episode with Ariella Palumbo. Um, uh, that's Boston's wife. Um, she discussed a little bit about PEDs. We're gonna have her back on next week and she'll talk a little bit more. I gotta tell you, if I were in your position, I would never have a woman use any kind of androgen at all. Uh, they all seem to at some point develop a little bit of voice changes, l lose a little bit of hair. It's not worth it. I would never ever recommend a female to do that. Um, and I think that those females will regret it one day. Because imagine when she's 60 years old and has this deep voice she can't gain muscle anymore. That stuff is all over. Now she just has a slightly deeper voice and uh, you know maybe some beard hair. Um, I know Anavar does this uh, less than other drugs and some women are able to not have changes from it, but they're very rare. I wouldn't do it. It's not worth it. Uh, even if this person, I mean, unless she's an elite athlete, maybe then it's worth it, but I don't think it's worth it. And uh, too many guys trick women into using androgens because they, I don't know why, but there are a lot of guys, whenever you find these women with like deep voices, stuff like that, you usually find their boyfriend is a failed bodybuilder. Usually he takes a lot of steroids, can't gain much muscle, so he convinced her to try it. And it's not a good, it's not a good thing, you know, you gotta be responsible. She may regret it one day a lot. Next, Hananda says, um, will I get stimulant psychosis from using 30 milligrams of dextroamphetamine daily for four days per week? Um, Stimulant psycho no, you're probably not gonna get stimulant psychosis. What you may get is dysregulated dopamine signaling, leading you eventually, say in two years, to developing bipolar disorder. Um, if you have uh, schizophrenic tendencies, you may end up with psychosis uh, or hallucinations, but that's less likely. What's much more likely is bipolar, bipolar disorder or even PTSD, like an overactive adrenaline system and so on. I would not do this. I would not use 30 milligrams. If you're using 30 milligrams, uh, there's a, there's a, it doesn't matter about your metabolism, that's too high of a dose. You've probably developed a tolerance because of what you've been doing. What I would do is take a month off and then try back again with five milligrams and see how that works for you. Maybe up to 10 milligrams maximum, you know? Um, next, Cody Wood says, coming off trend, but still on TRT at 250 milligrams every 10 days. How to get sex drive back quicker? Well, um, you know, the reason you have lower sex drive could be because of a couple of reasons. One is trend inhibits, potently inhibits steroidogenesis in the body. When you inject testosterone, it doesn't work as well for your sex drive as when you produce your own testosterone. So trend may be lowering the amount of testosterone you're producing yourself. And second, you have less total androgen signaling. You can get desensitized from that androgen signaling. 
The quickest way to do this is to produce your own testosterone, but it's not going to solve the problem completely because you're still going to have less total androgen levels. But producing your own testosterone was much more effective. So you can use HCG and recombinant FSH. Keep in mind, FSH itself massively increases sex drive. I don't mention FSH for no reason. It's, I know it's expensive, but it's massively incre increases sex drive. So I've talked about this many times on the channel, using something like 1,000 uh, units of HCG to 2,500 units of HCG every other day with 25 to 75 units of FSH. That'll do that. You'll have a much higher sex drive as long as you can keep estradiol below 25, between 15 to 25, something like that. Wow, I got through the 65 questions. Thank you guys so much for bearing with me. Um, sorry I didn't know the answer to all the questions, but I just wanted to address them so nobody feels like they're being ignored. Anyway, thank you again for bearing with me and I'll see you next time.